Okay, uh, this is uh, physiological psychology, and uh, we're going to uh, tackle chapter two today. Um, the chapter two is about the nervous system and behavior. And one of the most important things, one of the reasons that you really need to study or need to understand these things is because a lot of uh, what we're going to be talking about today has to do with how people react to things. Uh, we're going to talk about neurons. We're going to. Uh, this has to do with uh, how uh, mental illness is created uh, in neurons and how how we attempt to uh, alleviate uh, mental illness through uh, through medications that that change um, aspects of, of the neuron. If I can get this thing started, there we go. Okay, um, and and of course the 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 ner basic uh, instrument in the uh, nervous system is the neuron. It's composed of of billions and billions of of cells. The average human has between uh, one hundred billion and one hundred and fifty billion neurons. Most of these are in the brain. Neurons communicate with each other at a point known as the synapse. Uh, another cell that protects and adds structure to the nervous system is the glial cell. Uh, since we have 100, 100 to 150 billion neurons, uh, we have uh, at least that many uh, glial cells, probably more glial cells than nerve cells, the neurons. The neuron is composed of four major parts. Uh, the dendrites collect the stimuli for information and transmit it to the rest of the neuron. The soma, or the cell body, contains nucleus and serves to, to maintain the cell. The axon, axon is the main transmitting apparatus. The axon terminals are where the neuron passes on information to other cells or neurons. And as you can see, there are four different parts. These are the dendrites. This is the soma, or the cell body. This is the axon, and this is the axon terminal down here. So the information comes in through the dendrites. It passes through the soma into the axon. It travels down the axon to the axon terminals. And then it communicates with whatever. It communicates with another nerve. Uh, neuron uh, communicates with a muscle. It communicates with, uh, with a uh, uh, part, portions of the brain. It, 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 this is where the communication takes part. And the dendrites <clears throat> and then the axon terminal passes on the information. Neurons can be classified in three basic uh, ways. You can either uh, classify them by, by the shape of the neuron, by the size of the neuron, and, or by the function of the neuron. And of course when we identify a neuron we identify it by its shape, its size, and its function. Uh, all three of them at the same time. Uh, the shape, uh, multipolar uh, neurons have many dendrites and a single axon, and this is a uh, multipolar cell. Uh, most of the neurons of the vertebrate uh, brain are multipolar. They look like this. Uh, bipolar neurons have a single dendrite at one end and a single axon at the other. Uh, most of the neurons of the sensory uh, system are bipolar, especially those of the retina and the olfactory system. They are trying to communicate one little piece of information, uh, and that's the, the way that we see, that's the way that we smell. Monopolar neurons have a single branch coming off the soma that branches in two different directions. Uh, one branch will be the input direction, and the other will be the output direction. There are axons going in both direction, di directions. <laughs> some neurons are very large and some are very small. Examples of small uh, cells uh, would be granule spindles and stellate neurons. Uh, examples of large neurons would be pyramidal cells, Golgi cells, and Purkinje neurons. Functionally, uh, neurons either receive stimuli, create a response, or connect the two. Uh, sensory neurons collect the stimulus and pass the message on to the vast network of connectors, uh, connector neurons, uh, or interneurons. Motor neurons 
connect to muscles or glands and create the response by making the muscles contract or by changing the, act the activity of the, of the gland. Neurons do not touch each other. Uh, they communicate between the dendrite uh, of one neuron and the axon of another across a gap known as the synaptic cleft. At the end of, of the axon is the axon terminal. The axons end uh, in expanded areas called buttons or boutons. Of course, B-O-U-T-O-N-S is uh, French for button. The end of the axon is known as the presynaptic zone. The area of the receiving dendrite is known as the postsynaptic zone. The message is actually transported by a chemical known as a neurotransmitter that is contained in spheres in the axon called synaptic vesicles. And in later chapters, we'll talk about uh, the neurotransmitters and what those neurotransmitters do. One of the interesting areas of study dealing with the neuron are projections coming from the dendrites called spines. These spines seem to change with experience and have been known to change within seconds when an individual is exposed to a novel stimulus. So if you learn new information, uh, you're trying to remember that information, a spine will be created so that that information will stay in your brain. Uh, these spines, and of course you can see there's uh, a lot of different shapes of spines. The shape isn't nearly as important as the fact that you're, uh, you're creating a, uh, with practice, with uh, thinking about something or with doing something physical, uh, it creates memory. And the memory, of course, are these spines. If you don't practice it, if you don't think about it, uh, it will potentially go away and, and you will lose it. Just think of all the things that have happened to you throughout your life. You really can't remember all of them. Uh, and that's because uh, you didn't practice, uh, you didn't ex re-experience it and think about it over and over and over again. Or do it over and over and over again. And you didn't create memory. And this is, this is what the spines look like. Uh, these are examples of spines, and they are on all the neurons. Otherwise, the neurons wouldn't have anything to do. The axon uh, projects from the soma in an expanded area known as the axon hillock. The electrical impulse begins in the widened hillock and intensifies as it moves on into the narrower axon proper. So the information comes in here. It goes to the soma and then it goes down the axon to the axon terminal or the terminal button. Almost all neurons have only one axon. However, some have axons that divide and form several different branches. These branching is known as axon collaterals. When someone smashes their finger, finger the stimuli must follow a nerve pathway to tell the brain what has happened. Nerves that take stimuli from uh, its point of origin to the central nervous system are called afferent neurons. And this, of course, is in alphabetical order. So the information comes in in afferent neurons. When the brain or the spinal cord uh, sends back the message uh, to the affected area, the neurons on the reply pathway are referred to as efferent neurons. So we have afferent and efferent neurons. Uh, the afferent, of course, the information goes into the brain and the efferent sends the message back to the affected area from the brain. Afferent and efferent. So if you smash your finger, uh, the information goes to your brain uh, that, uh, ouch, I just smashed my finger, and uh, then the information goes back to the affected area and you move your hand out of the way so it doesn't get smashed again. The soma manufactures proteins that maintain growth and function in the neuron. This protein is able to make its way down into the uh, distant areas of the axon and dendrites by a process known as axonal transport. The protein is moved along tiny hollow cylinders known as microtubules. Protein molecules travel down smaller rods inside the microtubules called neurofilaments and even tinier microfilaments. Now this is this is important. The structure of the neuron and how chemicals move from one place to the other are very important because 
This is how we create medication. Uh, some of the medication will slow down the neuron. Uh, that's a good thing, especially if you have high blood pressure and uh, we're trying to control your blood pressure. So we need to slow down the protein moving through the microtubules, and we do this with a calcium channel blocker, or a beta blocker. And this, of course, to, uh, will con help control your, uh, it'll help control your blood pressure. So all of these, all of this information is really, really important if we're dealing with somebody who has a problem, who has a disease. Uh, let's say somebody has type 2 diabetes. How in the world are we going to control that? We control that with a, with a medication known as metformin. Metformin tells the uh, cells of the body that they need to utilize the, uh, the insulin. And... Uh, that's how it works. Uh, it's no, it's no, there's nothing magic about it. It has to do with all of these cells and understanding how these cells are affected if we give if we put certain chemicals in your body. Uh, personally, I have high blood pressure, and since I have high blood pressure, I need to take uh, medication that uh, lowers my blood pressure, and I do. I take two different medications that lower my blood pressure. Uh, that works because it uh, works on some of the chemicals. Uh, I'm not uh, one of is a uh, is a beta blocker, and that uh, slows down the uh, the neurons that tell my my heart to beat faster or to to beat with more pressure, and of course that lowers my blood pressure. Right now, if if I look at my uh, my Oh, oh my! <laughs> I'm looking at my heart monitor, and uh, I have 60 beats per minute. So every second, my heart is beating again, and that is my pulse. Glial cells are part of the neuronal system in that they uh, provide structure to the neuronal groupings and help hold them in place, and they help maintain the neurons by feeding them. There's four different types of glial cells, astrocytes, microglial cells, oligodendrocytes, and Schwann cells. Now, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells have to do with myelin. They have to do with uh, the speed of moving information from the, uh, from the dendrite to the, uh, the axon terminal. The astrocytes and the microglial cells have to do with structure. They're the ones that, uh, that uh, hold the uh, cells in place uh, we're, and we're, I think we're going to, yeah, we're going to talk about the astrocytes first. This is really kind of important because right now we're trying to figure out what's going on with Alzheimer's disease. Why do we have Alzheimer's disease? Why is it accelerating? Uh, and and uh, one of the things that we ha have discovered is that astrocytes and microglial cells are two of the reasons that uh, people develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's an auto, it turns out that, uh, that Alzheimer's disease is an autoimmune disease, uh, and it is the fact that the astrocytes and the glial, the, um, uh, microglial cells have, uh, are not functioning properly. And the reason they aren't is because either they're accelerating, uh, what they're supposed to do, or they're breaking down and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Astrocytes are star-shaped glial cells, astro means star, of course, uh, that protect neuronal bundles, especially in the brain. Uh, the dura mater, a tough sheet that is wrapped around the brain for protection, is composed of astrocytes. Uh, dura, dura mater means tough mother. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Anyway, that's the covering of the, uh, of the brain, is the dura mater. Astrocytes contribute to metabolism of the neuron and provide restorative protein to them, and if this breaks down, then we don't have any more restorative protein uh, going to the neurons, and of course that is uh, one of the definitions of Alzheimer's disease. Microglial cells are very small, that's why they're called micro, micro meaning small glial cells. They migrate to areas of injury or disease and remove debris from injured or dead neurons. Now this, of course, is what Alzheimer's disease is. Uh, your body stops getting rid of the waste products uh, of, your, of your neurons. And because of that, 
Uh, you get a buildup of toxins in the brain, and of course, this is part of what Alzheimer's disease is. So as we look at Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that we see is a buildup of what, what is referred to as tau protein. The tau protein, of course, are, are uh, produced by astrocytes. The tau protein, of course, is... Uh, not being utilized because the astrocytes are malfunctioning. The microglial cells are supposed to clean this stuff up. This uh, uh, a, a neuron that is malfunctioning needs to be taken out of the uh, out of the brain. And of course, that's the job of the microglial cell. The microglial cells aren't working properly anymore, and all of a sudden we get a buildup of injured or dead neurons that uh, create. Uh, uh, neurofibrillary tangles and of course the individual loses their memory because the neurons that we were talking about before uh, that are creating the memory uh, these things go away and now all of a sudden we can't we can't remember things anymore uh, and that is what Alzheimer's disease is. Oligodendrocytes, uh, the myelin sheaths that surround the, and protect the neurons are created by these glial cells, the oligodendrocytes. These myelin sheaths not only protect the neuron, but they accelerate the response of the neuron. Uh, oligodendrocytes uh, provide a myelin in the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, the oligodendrocytes are the myelin in the central nervous system. The Schwann cells are in the muscular system or the peripheral uh, nervous system. Oligodendrocytes means little tree cell in uh, Latin, I believe. Schwann cells construct the myelin outside the brain and spinal column. Schwann cells uh, are small and each one will wrap itself around the axon to protect it and accelerate the response. So if we are talking about a select neuron, it may have 10 or 15 uh, Schwann cells or or oligodendrocytes wrapped around the axon, and for this reason, there are more Schwann, there are more glial cells uh, certainly than there are <clears throat> neurons. And as we said, there's 100 uh, to 150 billion uh, nerve neurons in your brain. Uh, well, you can multiply that times 10 or 15, or we're not exactly sure how many they are. We're, we certainly have never counted them but uh, there are a lot more glial cells than there are neurons. When you look at the myelin formed around an axon, you will see that Schwann cells don't touch each other, but leave a gap between each cell. These gaps are known as nodes of Ranvier. And what it does, it accelerates the process. And sometimes it'll accelerate the movement of information down a neuron uh, by several hundred times. When an individual suffers a blow to the head, the injury tends to heal slower than a blow to any other part of the body. This is because besides causing localized damage, the glial cells become larger by taking on moisture. And the reason they do this, uh, the reason they take on moisture is to protect the neuron. They don't want the neuron to die. Uh, and of course, uh, they are trying to protect it from uh, the blow that has created whatever it is, and uh, they swell up. And because they swell up, of course, uh, it uh, can cause uh, problems right after the, bl the blow, the TBI, the, the traumatic brain injury. This is known as edema, and it may put pressure on select parts of the brain causing malfunction. The edema will. Now, the edema eventually will go away because the swelling isn't permanent. Uh, swelling rarely is permanent. Uh, the longer it is sitting there, the longer it uh, destroys whatever it is around. Uh, so this is this can be really, really dangerous, uh, especially if, if there, it's a blow to the head. I mean, we see this all the time. Let's say you're running down the, the road and you twist your ankle and it, you sprain your ankle. It will swell up. And the reason it swells up, it swells up with, uh, with fluid, but it also swells up with blood. And, and then it becomes edematous. Uh, it's trying to uh, isolate. Uh, it's trying to protect uh, the ankle so that the, you won't hurt it again. Uh, and that's the reason it swells up. Well, the same thing happens in your brain with all of these neurons. Now, if this, uh, and of course, it puts pressure on the brain 
and sometimes you can make the individual comatose if it's if it's in the right area of the brain will make the individual comatose but one of the things that uh, we are doing now is that we are are inducing uh, comas uh, in individuals if they have swelling on the brain uh, we are inducing comas so that the uh, body can heal itself and then we'll bring them out of the coma it's a cell it's a uh, it's a self-induced coma, artificially induced coma. The nervous system of the human body can be subdivided into two nervous systems. So I hope that made a lot of sense. It sounds like we're, we're doing some really crazy things, but the reality is the brain is, needs to be protected. And the way that we protect it, the way that you protected it yourself is that it swells up trying to protect itself. Uh, sometimes if there's damage done, uh, one of the things we need to do is to allow it to heal. I don't know if you've ever injured yourself uh, and, and it just wouldn't heal. Uh, sometimes if you can reduce the swelling, uh, then it'll, it'll heal almost immediately. And that's what you need. The, the body is, is uh, creating a situation where the, bain, the pain stays there. Uh, and the reason it stays there is because, uh, be because it hurts. <clears throat> so if you can reduce that pain, then the edema will go down and, and the, the body will heal itself. And sometimes that, takes, that doesn't take very long at all. It can, it can take uh, two or three days. Uh, so sometimes, what did I do the other day? I hurt my knee. I was, you know, we, we had that, uh, that windstorm here and I was hauling wood and I was, I was walking backwards and I was putting a lot of pressure on my knees and my right knee hurt, started hurting it, it, uh, and it started swelling a little bit. And so for a couple days there, I had, uh, I had pain. Uh, well, normally I don't take, I, I don't take anything for pain. I just let it go away on its own. And that's what happened after a couple days, the swelling went down. And now I don't have any pain in my knee. I can go up and down the stairs without any pain at all. But there for a while, my knee was feeling pretty uh, hinky. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it felt pretty bad. <laughs> so all I needed to do was uh, to, to, to rest and let it heal itself. And that's exactly what happened. It healed itself. Uh, the nervous system of the human body can be subdivided divided into two nervous systems. Uh, the central nervous system, which is com comprises is comprised of the brain and the spinal column, and all the other nerves are called the peripheral nervous system. Anything that isn't a, a, a part of the brain or the spinal column is the peripheral nervous system, and this is what it looks like. As you can see on the right, we have the brain and the spinal column. This is the central nervous system, and everything else uh, that isn't the brain or the spinal column is the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nerves are categorized by what part of the central nervous system they are connected to. There are cranial nerves that are connected directly to the brain. We have spinal nerves that are direct, uh, connected directly to the spinal column. We have autonomic nerves in the autonomic uh, nervous system that are connected to glands and organs and trigger automatic responses from these areas. There are 12 cranial nerves that control sensory or muscular movements in the head or the neck region. Four of the nerves control the muscles of the eye and the eyesight uh, sensations. Four control the muscles of the neck, face, and tongue, and the sensations of tongue, sinuses, and throat. One controls the sensations of the inner ear. The vagus nerve, of course, controls your heart, your lungs, and your digestion. Real important that your vagus nerve is healthy. It's in the middle of your body. It's really hard to get to. So it's not like you're going to pinch it all of a sudden and your heart stops beating. It doesn't work that way. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, one pair on each side of the body. There are five segments of the spinal cord and column. Uh, there are eight cervical nerves. Cervical is, nerves are in your neck. And cervical actually means collar, like, like the collar of your shirt. Uh, so there's eight cervical nerves. There are 12 thoracic nerves. If you um, uh, were in an automobile accident and your head slammed up against 
uh, the back of the seat, it would cause what they call whiplash, uh, where the natural curve of your neck would be straightened out. And if that happens, of course, it affects your these uh, cervical nerves and uh, it gives you a headache and it gives you a neck ache. And that, that's one of the reasons why uh, if you are in uh, uh, an accident like that, they'll put a cervical collar around it. And that's mostly to protect the cervical nerves because you don't want any damage to those nerves. Uh, that can cause a great deal of pain. There are 12 thoracic nerves. Usually the pain uh, comes in your head uh, comes from the fact that you're holding your, your head in a certain uh, position and uh, the muscles of your face uh, tighten up and that causes you to have a headache. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, there, there are 12 thoracic nerves. Uh, the, your th thoracic area is in your torso. Uh, thoracic means brace. Uh, there's five lumbar nerves. That's your lower back. This is where people, most, as humans, uh, we should probably not be standing upright. Um, and that, for that reason, uh, if we look at the spinal column, we have a natural curve, a natural S curve in our spinal columns. And uh, the weakest portion is, is where one of those curves is, the last curve, uh, next to the last curve. Uh, and that is the lumbar region. And this is one of the reasons why uh, if we're not very careful, we don't protect the, our back muscles. If we lift with our back rather than with our legs, that uh, this is the area that we, we damage. This is an area that we hurt. Uh, so if you're smart, uh, here I am 71 years old and I've never had, I've never had a back, uh, back problem. The reason is because I always lift with my legs and I never lift with my back. Uh, that and I work on my arms to make sure my arms are nice and strong. So if I lift, I lift with my arms and I lift with my legs. And I try not to use my spinal column to, to, uh, uh, to brace myself. Because that, uh, you can imagine if you, you, know, you get that whiplash and it straightens out your back. If we lose that S curve in our spinal column, uh, now we've got all kinds of in interesting nerve problems, not just in our cervical area, but area, but especially in our in our lumbar region. And that's what normally if we have back problems, it's it's in the lumbar region because that is the uh, that's the weakest portion of our back. <clears throat> uh, how can I explain this? Okay, um, yeah, and lumbar of course means belt. Um, our, our lumbar region is protected by our stomach muscles, uh, and that's the reason why, um, and stomach muscles are really hard to build up. Uh, you can build up your, 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 pel your <laughs> pectoralis muscles, your chest muscles, you can uh, build up your back muscles. It's really hard to deal with your stomach muscles. Muscles, a lot of times when people work on their stomach muscles, they start having back problems. And the reason is because they're hyperextending uh, their, uh, their back as compared to their stomach muscles. There are five sacral muscles. That's in your pelvic region. Uh, sacral means girdle. And then there's one coccygeal nerve, and that, uh, that is uh, just above your gluteus maximus, uh, your butt. Uh, and coccygeal means tailbone in Latin. All of these are Latin words. And there you go. There's the cervical nerves. There are the thoracic nerves. Uh, this portion, as you can see, it curves in the right direction, so it's really protected. Uh, but your lumbar section bends the other way. And because of that, this is the weakest section. Uh, this section is, actually this should be more, there should be more of a curve here in the cervical nerves. But the lumbar region, of course, as you can see, it bulges out. And because of that, this is the, this is the weakest area. This, is, this area, your back muscles are really protected. Uh, because it, it, it bulges in the right direction, so it pr it's uh, pretty much protected. And there you go.
So this one move, uh, is bends in the wrong direction, this one bends in the right direction, so it's more protected. And then your cervical nerves are, of course, uh, it's more it's more curved than that. Anyway, there you go. Uh, the automatic uh, or autonomic nervous system is divided into two nervous systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system prepares your body for action by shutting down normal functions, it increases your power stores, and it increases your sensory activity. Your parasympathetic nervous system returns the body to normal from the, from the sympathetic uh, reaction. When the need for action, uh, action is detected, the sympathetic nervous system will dilate your pupils, improving your eyesight. It inhibits your salivation, causing dry, dry mouth, and this, the salivation has to do with digestion. Uh, so it stops your salivation so that your digestion will slow down and stop. It relaxes your airways, allowing deeper breathing so that you can react to whatever is whatever the danger is. It accelerates your heart rate, giving you more power. It stimulates your sweat glands. Uh, it stimulates your liver uh, to release energy stores. It slows down your digestion. Uh, of course, that has to do with salivation as well. It inhibits your kidney function because kidneys, uh, at this stage, of course, uh, your, your kidneys uh, are, are taking a lot of energy away. So it, it stops your digestion because you don't need uh, all that energy taken away uh, uh, through digestion. And it slows down your kidney functions. Uh, it constricts your blood vessels in your skin. And this is one of the reasons why when you're scared or when you have adrenaline rushing through your body that you are pale. You look pale. Uh, parasympathetic nervous system reverses the whole process. It constricts your, your pupils. Uh, your, your eyesight's not nearly as good. And this is one of the things people, uh, they get into a dangerous situation and all of a sudden everything slows down. Now what in the world's going on? Does it just time really slow down? No, what is happening is your it dilates your pupils, so your eyesight is improved. So you're taking in a lot more than you were before. Normally you have focused vision, all of a sudden you see everything, and that makes it seem like everything has slowed down. It stimulates salivation, so all of a sudden, you know, you're, you start salivating more. Now your digestion is going to start, but also you you don't you you have a mouthful of spit. It constricts your airways because you don't need uh, you don't need your your breathing doesn't need to be accelerated. It slows down your heartbeat. It stimulates your digestion. It dilates the blood vessels in your intestines so that you can start digesting, digesting food again. And it dilate, dilates blood vessels in your skin, making you flushed. So if you see somebody who's scared, uh, they think they saw a ghost, they, uh, they look pale. Uh, but if uh, afterwards, uh, if you look at them, their face is all flushed. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why. The average human brain uh, weighs about 1,400 grams. That's about three pounds. Uh, the major part of the brain is the cerebrum, uh, which is uh, divided into two hemispheres. Uh, intellectual capacity seems to be contained in the surface area of the brain. It's only about uh, an in eighth of an inch uh, into your brain. That's, that's the thinking portion of your brain. Uh, and it's only in, in the eight, eighth of an inch surface of your brain. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. The surface area of the brain is increased through ridges and folding that triples the, the surface area of the brain. So if we look at the human brain, one of the things that we see is it looks like a... Uh, it kind of looks like a cauliflower. Uh, there's lots of ridges. There's lots of folds. Uh, convolutions and furrows, uh, which are called gyri and sulci. These convolutions and furrows. The brain contains uh, four fairly distinct lobes that have four fairly distinct functions. The frontal lobe is in the front of the brain and is the seat of higher uh, level thought. And this, of course, is the frontal lobe. The red, the red lobe is the frontal lobe. Uh, the parietal lobe is, is on top of the brain and controls uh, fine body movements, 
especially this area right here. This is the parietal lobe, so it's uh, right on top of your head. Uh, the occipital lobe is in the back. This has to do with eyesight. Uh, and then the temporal lobe has to do with hearing. And as you can see, it's the blue area. So the green is the occipital lobe. The yellow is the parietal lobe. The re red is the frontal lobe. This is, this is where, you, these are where your eyes are. Here's your cerebellum down here. Uh, but this is the front of your, this is your forehead right here. This is where your forehead would be. That's the frontal lobe parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. If an individual lost half of their brain before they reached puberty, except for some fine motor movements, they would seem perfectly normal. And, and this sometimes this has to happen. Uh, we will do what is referred to as a hemispherectomy. Uh, the reason we do that is because if they have epilepsy, and it's usually in one side of the brain, uh, that portion of the brain we will remove because uh, they are getting too many electrical impulses and uh, it makes them non-functional. Uh, so what we will do is take out half their brain. This is a last ditch effort to slow down the uh, uh, this is the last ditch effort to slow down the epilepsy uh, but it's a good way of controlling it. You can control epilepsy this way. Uh, normally individuals don't have that severe of epilepsy so a hemispherectomy is really relatively rare. However, we can do that if we have to. The two hemispheres of the brain are connected by a mass of thick myelinated neurons called the corpus callosum. In this picture, it's red. We're going to talk about the corpus callosum uh, a lot. Uh, it has to do with connect uh, the, the communication between one hemisphere of the brain and the other hemisphere of the brain. Uh, in the case of select types of uh, intellectual deficits, uh, such as uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, one of the reasons that they are suffering so much is because uh, the uh, corpus callosum is, is small, is much, much smaller. Now, weirdly enough, and, and you young ladies out there are going to find this humorous, uh, but uh, the, the male brain is actually larger than the female brain, uh, but it really, the size of the brain doesn't really mean anything. But the, the corpus callosum, female corpus callosum is much larger for a female, is much larger than a male's corpus callosum, as weird as that may seem. So a, the female brain, while it has, is, is smaller than the male brain, it actually has a larger corpus callosum. So the communication going on between the hemispheres is much higher. Well, does one thing have anything have more have something to do with intelligence? And the answer is, uh, you guys can argue that for yourselves. Are women smarter than men? Uh, are men smarter because their brains are bigger? Are women smarter because their corpus callosum is larger? And the answer is probably they're about the same. But that's uh, that's just the way it works. If we cross-sectioned an individual's brain, we would see that uh, some of the brain is made up of tightly packed, non-myelinated neurons that look gray, and this is known as gray matter. The reason it's gray is because it's non-myelinated. The glial cells that myelinate, that, uh, that protect the, uh, the uh, brain cells, the oligodendrocytes, uh, these are, are white, and if, they're, if they don't have the oligodendrocytes wrapped around the axon of the neuron, then they look gray. Other areas look white because of the myelinated neurons that make them up. Researchers have found that the larger the gray areas of the brain, the more intelligent the individual is. And that's just the way it is. On the brain, the outer surface is gray and the, and the inner surface is white. So if we cut into the brain, we can see uh, the, the outside uh, eighth of an inch is, will be gray, and the inside uh, about a half an inch will be white. The spinal column is the opposite. The outside of the spinal column is white, and the inside of the spinal column is gray. As the baby begins to develop uh, from ever-expanding number of cells, the brain and the central nervous system begin as a structure known as the neural tube. In the beginning, the smaller, more primitive parts of the brain develop before the intellectual portion of the brain, the cerebral cortex. 
So the first thing that actually develops in the baby's brain is the spinal column and the primitive portions of the brain, the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. The cerebellum surrounds two areas that scientists consider an evolutionarily old part of the brain that they sometimes refer to as the reptilian brain. There are two portions of their reptilian brain, the basal ganglia and the limbic system. Uh, basal ganglia means basic nerve sheath, and limbic system means border system. Limbic is uh, obviously is, means border. The basal ganglia includes the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus uh, pallidus, the, and the substantia nigra. Caudate means tail, putamen means stone, Globus pallidus means pale sphere, and substantia nigra means black substance. Nigra, of course, is uh, Latin for black. Substantia means substance. The limbic system is made up of the amygdala, the hippocampus, the fornix, the cingulate gyrus, the olfactory bulb, and the mammillary bodies. The uh, amygdala actually means almond. That the reason is because it is uh, almond shaped. Uh, they're right here. The amygdala is right at the end of the uh, fornix. Uh, hippocampus means seahorse. Uh, hippo is the Latin word for horse. So a hippopotamus is a river horse. Uh, fornix means arch. Uh, cingulate gyrus means round. Okay. The largest organ in the uh, center of the brain is the thalamus. Uh, thalamus is uh, Latin for inner chamber, and it, this is what the thalamus looks like. There's two, one for each hemisphere. The thalamus acts as, the, as a connector between the upper and the lower parts of the brain. Uh, in the beginning, these things were so large, we assumed that they had a, a, this massive function. The reality is they act as a... Uh, they uh, will take information and they'll send it to the portion of the brain that it needs to go to. That's all they do. It acts as a conductor. Uh, the real controlling uh, uh, gland in the brain, of course, is the hypothalamus. Uh, the reason it's called hypothalamus, hypothalamus means uh, lesser thalamus. As you can see, the thalamus is up here and the, the hypothalamus is right below it. And because it's right below it, of course, it was referred to as the lesser thalamus. Uh, people didn't understand what it did. We used to call the pituitary the master gland, but the reality is that the pituitary is controlled by the thalamus, by the hypothalamus, I'm sorry. Um, and it's not very big, uh, as you can see. It's right, right in the middle of your brain. It needs to be protected. Uh, I had a friend, a uh, colleague that I worked with uh, in Montana, who uh, had brain cancer, and they were trying to melt his tumor with radiation. And unfortunately, they got too close to the thalamus, and they destroyed the thalamus. So this guy had to take a fistful of, of medication every day. Uh, the medication took the place of his, the, his functioning hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus controls your hunger, it controls your thirst, it regulates your temperature, it controls reproductive behavior, it controls the pituitary gland, which in turn controls all the hormones secre secreting organs in your body. Uh, the midbrain, uh, two of the most important areas of the midbrain are the tiny bumps known as the superior and inferior colliculi. Colliculi is Latin for trough. Uh, the superior colliculi receives visual information, and the inferior colliculi receives information about sound. Uh, so these guys, uh, what they do is uh, they allow you to see and they allow you to hear things. Uh, the substantia nigra, the black substance, uh, releases dopamine, uh, and dopamine if the dopamine-producing area of your brain uh, dies or it uh, uh, starts to, to deteriorate and you don't have enough dopamine, it causes uh, a condition known as Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease has to do with movement. It also has to do with memory. Uh, if you have too many dopamine, uh, uh, if you have too much dopamine in your body, in your brain, uh, 
then it causes schizophrenia. So dopamine is really, really important, and it's extremely important for you to have exactly the right amount. Because if you don't have, if you have uh, too little dopamine, it causes Parkinson's disease. And if you have too much dopamine uh, and too many dopamine receptor sites, then it will cause uh, a person uh, to be schizophrenic. The reticular network, uh, the reticular formation runs from the, the midbrain to the uh, medulla. Reticular means network. Uh, this portion of the brain controls sleep and arousal, uh, temperature regulation, and motor control. It is the reticular formation that arouses a person when their baby cries. It's also the reticular formation that can cause an individual to, to go into a coma. If this area swells, if the area around the reticular uh, formation swells up, uh, then it will put pressure on this area and the person will not be uh, able to wake up because it controls sleep. They'll also have a difficult time maintaining their temperature. And for that reason, if you've ever been around somebody in a coma, uh, they were either in a very warm room or uh, they were covered with, uh, with blankets to, uh, uh, to keep them uh, warm enough. Uh, otherwise, they would, they would literally freeze to death in a, in a not very cold room. The cerebellum is composed of tightly packed and folded neurons. And the neurons in the cerebellum form an interesting fan-shaped structure that includes granule cells, Golgi cells, and Purkinje cells. Purkinje cells, uh, of course, they're called Purkinje cells because Purkinje is the one that discovered them. Purkinje cells are contained in the middle layer of the neurons in the cerebellum. Purkinje cells are large, multipolar neurons shaped like fans with many dendritic spines. These cells run from the surface of the cerebellum to the brain stem. The intricacy of the Purkinje cells allows the cerebellum to control both the fine and gross motor functions of the body. The position of the cerebellum between the spinal cord and the thalamic centers that communicate with the motor complex allows it to control motor functioning. Uh, so let's say that you have never uh, played basketball before. Uh, they're trying to teach you to dribble the basketball. Uh, it becomes, uh, you can, pretty soon you can dribble the basketball without even thinking about it. Why do you, how are you able to do that? It's muscle memory. And then the, the coach is trying to teach you how to uh, do a layup. And the first time you try a layup, of course, you, you look pretty, uh, pretty silly. Uh, you uh, go off on the wrong foot. Uh, you raise the wrong leg. And, and, of course, it doesn't quite work that way. But the more times you, you practice this, uh, the better you get at it. And pretty soon you can do a layup without even thinking about it. Why? Remember those, uh, those uh, dendritic spines we were talking about? This has created muscle memory. Uh, if you throw a baseball, you don't have to think about it. Uh, all you do is you, you look toward where you want to throw the ball or throw whatever you want to throw, and you, and you move your arm in the correct way and you throw it. Uh, it doesn't look awkward. Uh, why is this? Because this is muscle memory, and this is what the dendritic spines are all about. How many times does it take to get something right? Uh, some people can do things uh, the first time they, they try to do them, but for most individuals, it takes uh, practicing something three times before it becomes muscle memory or any kind of a memory. And this is uh, not a bad idea as far as trying to learn something for a test. If you see it, if you read it, if you think about it three times, it's stuck in your memory and it will stay for an extended length of time. should stay forever. If you do it twice, eh, probably won't stick. But if you do it three times, three times is a magic number. So there you go. If you want to remember something, read it three times. The cerebellum leads into the pons, the first portion of the brainstem. Pons actually means bridge. This is really kind of interesting because if you've ever heard of DuPont, uh, the chemical company, uh, what does DuPont mean? Pont Pont means bridge. It means two bridges. De means two, two bridges. I used to live in, in uh, uh, 
Zweibrücken. Zweibrücken is, uh, is in Germany. Uh, and the reason Zweibrücken is named Zweibrücken is because Zwei means two and Brücken means bridges. Uh, there was two bridges across uh, whatever the river was. I can't remember the river, river's name. But uh, the French called it Dupont. Why did they call it Dupont? Because it's two bridges. So Pons means bridge. It's involved in motor control and sensory analysis. Information from the ear first enters the brain and the pons. Uh, the bottom of the brain stem is made up of the medulla. Medulla is, means in the middle or it means marrow. Uh, so medulla is always on the inside. Um, the medulla controls both the neck and the tongue muscles. Uh, something I'm having trouble with right now because I seem to be mispronouncing things from time to time. Uh, the medulla also contributes to the regulation of breathing and your heart rate. The main intellectual functions uh, occur in the cerebral cortex. Cerebral means layer. Cortex means layer. Uh, external layer is what it means, cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex or is made up of gray matter. It has six layers. It's six layers thick, and it contains between 50 billion and 100 billion neurons. The functions of the various regions of the cerebral cortex have been mapped and divided into 46 distinctive areas known in toto as Brodmann's areas. And of course, Brodmann is the individual that first figured these things out. The most nu numerous neuron in the cerebral cortex is the pyramidal cell. And this is what a pyramidal cell looks like, as you can see. It's shaped in, as like a triangle. It looks like a pyramid. Pyramidal cell dendrites uh, reach to the surface of the cortex and also spread out horizontally. These neurons seem to be arranged in columns. Now, if you're trying to remember something, how, how in the world do you do this? Uh, well, you try to find a cue for, for your memory. Uh, so you're thinking in, uh, we talk about thinking in silos, but the reality is all all of our brain, all of the our, our memory cells are created in silos. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to get into that silo to remember this p little piece of information. And you have something that is hinting, hinted to you. Uh, you know, you want to remember. You know, who's saying, uh, uh, "I'm nothing but a ain't nothing but a hound dog," crying all the time. Ain't nothing but a hound dog. Just crying all the time. Now, who sings that? Well, of course, because we have these hints, uh, we can throw those the lyrics in there, and we we can remember that Elvis Presley is the first person to to sing that silly song. Many brain regions have distinctive geometric columnar uh, patterns that seem to function as information processing units. Some columns begin at the surface and extend all the way to the white matter. Uh, the human cerebral cortex contains about a million cortical columns. Uh, most cerebral communication runs vertically, but there are some areas of horizontal communication. The cortical columns of the neocortex are arranged in six, six distinctive, distinct layers. Uh, however, most communication is vertical, and select neurons will extend through several layers, some through all six layers. And this is what it looks like, as you can see. Now, as you can also see, it's, it's very uh, structured. Um, one of the things we have, to, and it's, it's vertical, uh, the structure tends to be relatively vertical. So you're, you won't be thinking about Elvis Presley and then all of a sudden, uh, you, a recipe for lasagna comes up into your brain. That's not the way it tends to work. If you're thinking about Elvis Presley, all of a sudden you're thinking of all the songs that Elvis sang. And that's the way it tends to work. Now, one of the things we know about schizophrenia is that you can see how organized all of these columns are. One of the things we know about schizophrenia, something has happened to this individual to mess up the structure of these columns. And for that reason, uh, if you've ever been around somebody that was schizophrenic, uh, they'll be talking about uh, uh, their brand new uh, Ford uh, Focus uh, vehicle, and then all of a sudden they'll talk about 
uh, asteroids, or all of a sudden they're, they're they can't they can't keep a select uh, piece of information in their mind, and the reason is because their columns are messed up. Uh, they are disorganized, and because that uh, they don't get vertical thoughts, they get horizontal thoughts, and they just bounce all over the place. And that's one of the reasons that people suffer from schizophrenia. Something has happened to their brain. Um, there are lots of different theories as to what's going on. You have a genetic proclivity for it, for one thing, uh, but also there has been some kind of a trauma to their brain. Usually it, it has to do with, uh, with the flu, and sometimes it's not the flu that they caught when they were five years old. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with the fact that when their mother was pregnant, she got the flu while their brain was developing. Anyway, these, and these are all theories. We're not exactly sure. Uh, their schizophrenia may be like five or ten or, or 150 different uh, problems uh, that we refer to as that manifests itself as what we call schizophrenia. But we'll talk about that later. Besides the bony skull, the brain is protected by three protective sheets called meninges. Uh, meninges is Latin for membrane, and it is. It's three different membranes. The outer layer is a tough envelope of cells called the dura mater. Dura means hard. Mater means mother, hard mother. <laughs> the middle layer contains an open portion known as the arachnoid through which flows CSF. CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. It is a clear fluid. It has, there's nothing in it. Uh, it's, it's just salt water. That's all it is. Uh, and it's, it's, it's sticky. And the reason I know this is because I used to be a lab tech and we used to work with cerebrospinal fluid all the time. I'm, the, uh, they, in order to get cerebrospinal fluid, somebody would have to have a spinal tap. In other words, they'd stick a needle into their, their uh, spinal column and they would uh, uh, stick it into the open area, into this area here, and they would draw off some CSF. They draw, draw off some cerebrospinal fluid. The inner layer is a delicate membrane known as the pia mater. That means gentle mother. And this, of course, is the pia mater. This is the dura mater. This, this is really tough. Uh, so when we were, and of course the doctors had to do it, we didn't do it, we were lab techs. Uh, so what they do, uh, they stick a needle through the dura mater. It's kind of tough to get through, it has to be a really sharp needle. And we stick the needle into here and draw off some cerebrospinal fluid. This is done in the lumbar region of your back. <clears throat> and of course I don't want to get into the, uh, the pia mater because then they may do damage uh, to the spinal column. So they, it's, it's kind of tricky, and doctors have to learn how to do this. I'm not sure how they learn how to do it. But they stick uh, through the skin, of course, uh, into, through the dura mater and into the arachnoid process. The brain is not a solid mass. There are four open areas called ventricles, and the blue sections here are ventricles. These are open sections of the brain. Uh, if you are normal, then these aren't very large. If you are a boxer, then one of the things that happens is the brain, uh, the neurons in your brain uh, become damaged and they go away, and these ventricles actually get bigger. And you don't want that. Uh, other people that have large ventricles are people who are suffering from schizophrenia. Uh, and the, the reason is because they're not using their entire brain, and some of their brain will atrophy. And when it atrophies, these ventricles get larger. All these blue areas become uh, much, much larger. The ventricle, and we're going to talk more about this later, um, there, the ventricles one and two are, vent are lateral ventricles in each hemisphere, and these are the these are the lateral ventricles. Uh, ventricle three is between the hemispheres below uh, one and two, and this is uh, this is three right here, and then fourth vent fourth ventricle is right there. It's right in front of the uh, it's right in front of the cerebellum. These aren't well; they they tend not to be very large areas, as you can see. Uh, unless you've got a problem. 
CSF is produced in the choroid uh, plexus. Uh, the and choroid plexus means separate braid. It's part. It's actually part of the lining of the ventricles. Let me go back. Yeah, it's right here. These ventricles right here. That's where it's located. CSF is basically plasma or blood with red and white uh, cells removed. Uh, if we draw CSF and there's blood in there, uh, it can mean that there's damage uh, to the uh, brain or to the spinal column. Uh, so if we see blood, that's not a good thing. If we see white cells, it means there's an infection. And of course, you certainly don't want an infection in your brain. Uh, that's also known as meningitis, and that will kill you. Uh, the functions of CSF include it acts as a shock absorber for the brain. Uh, the brain floats in CSF, so head movements do not disturb the brain. Uh, it collects nutrients from blood vessels and passes them on to the brain surface. And that's what your CSF does. It acts as a shock absorber. So it's real important to have, you know, we talk about big brain people. We, one of the things we're talking about is big headed people. <laughs> Does that mean they have more CSF? Probably not. They probably have a brain. All of our brains, uh, all of us have about the same amount of CSF. Blood is supplied to the brain through two significant arteries that run on each side of the esophagus. Uh, the carotid uh, arteries uh, are on each side of your esophagus. I'm pointing to them right here. Now they're right here. These are your carotids. But you can feel it. Uh, you can actually knock yourself out by pinching one of those off. Carotid means plunge into sleep and the reason is because if you if you hold the carotid artery the person will, will uh, pass out. The vertebral arteries uh, bracket the spinal cord and enter uh, at the base of the skull. Uh, so you have four major arteries going into your brain. This is very important. Uh, if one of these is cut, is severed, uh, then that uh, will lead to the individual losing blood very, very rapidly, and they will potentially bleed out and die. And there you go. We have, here you go. There's your carotid artery and your spinal artery. And you can see them back here in this angiogram. At the base of the brain, uh, the carotid and basilar or base arteries join to form a structure called the circle of Willis. Uh, the emerging of these two cerebral arteries provides a backup in uh, case blood flow is impinged on one of the two major arteries. Uh, I had a friend, uh, and of course, as you get older, uh, sometimes you get blockage uh, in your some of your arteries. One of the arteries uh, that you can get blockage in is your carotid arteries. So one of the things that uh, they started doing when I would go in for a physical uh, they would start, uh, they would put uh, their stethoscope up against my carotid artery to make sure that there, that I, I had good blood flow. I had a friend uh, who was having problems with his legs and uh, they checked his blood flow and what they discovered was that one of his carotid arteries was uh, blocked, uh, was blocked to some extent. He had an occlusion. Uh, and they uh, went in and they, they opened it up. They were able to open it up, and that changed everything. He, he was a runner, and of course, uh, because he had the one blockage, uh, he wasn't able to run very well. Uh, of course, one of his legs had less um, blood flow than the other. Despite the rich tissue of the brain and the myriad of viruses and bacteria seeking entry, infections in the organ rarely occur. And this is because the capillaries in the brain are much smaller than the capillaries in other parts of the body. Substances in the blood will rarely pass into the brain, and this is called the blood-brain barrier. So if we look at all the capillaries all over our bodies, they're relatively large, Kind of, kind of large, so that it can transfer uh, uh, oxygen. Uh, that's what the capillaries do. It, uh, it transfers oxygen. But into your brain, uh, the, the capillaries become very, very tiny. And this is so the bacteria and viruses, nothing can get into your brain. We don't want anything to cross the blood-brain barrier unless it's, well, there are some antibiotics. Most antibiotics will not get into your brain. It's just the way it works. Uh, so uh, when somebody has meningitis, uh, we have to treat them with special uh, medications. Uh, 
uh, that will cross the blood-brain barrier. An angiogram, or uh, angiogram means vessel picture, is an x-ray of the blood vessels. If a stroke is suspected, an individual can uh, be injected with a dye in the skull, uh, can be x-rayed to show visible hemorrhages, aneurysms, or occlusions. And what we're looking for is we're looking for a place where the person is bleeding. That's a hemorrhage. Uh, an aneurysm is where the blood vessel weakens and it balloons out. Uh, that's why aneurysm means widen, uh, and this blood vessel will have a, a, a pouch. It looks like a balloon. Uh, if that thing bursts, then the individual can, can uh, it will cause a hemorrhage. Uh, but it can, if, uh, if it's ballooning out, it can put pressure on part, portions of the brain, and the individual will have uh, all kinds of interesting uh, reactions from that. They won't be able to speak, potentially, uh, they uh, won't be able to remember things. It, it causes all kinds of interesting problems, and that is because uh, it all depends on where it is, of course, in the brain. Occlusion means blood clot. Uh, occlusion means clot or blockage. So if we get a blockage in the brain, then that portion of the brain will die, and of course that's a stroke. If we have a bleeding out, then that's a cerebral hemorrhage, uh, on, another type of stroke, and that is will cause a portion of the brain to die. Now, or an aneurysm will put pressure on the brain. And because it puts pressure on that area of the brain, that, that area of the brain uh, may die as well. And that can be a, that, that is a, another form of a stroke. Uh, this is usually the first test performed if a patient is suspected of having a stroke, an angiogram, and this is what it looks like. A CAT scan is an x-ray of a thin sliver of tissue. If a patient is suspected of having a tumor or a stroke, a CAT scan would, would allow the physician to visualize the affected area. This is a CAT scan of a cerebral hemorrhage. This person is bleeding into their brain. Now blood uh, is supposed to be in your blood vessels. If it gets into your tissues, then a lot of times it can cause the tissue, uh, it becomes toxic. And if that happens, then it will kill that portion of the, of the, uh, of the body. And this is one of the reasons why your body tries to break down bruises, tries to break down these things as rapidly as it possibly can. Uh, that's the reason that it turns different colors. When you first bruise yourself, of course, it's purple. Uh, the purple color means that that is raw blood, uh, and that needs to be removed. So what the body will do, it will send uh, lysis, and it will try to lyse the cells. And if it does that, it can remove all the toxic aspect of it. And that's the reason it turns green, and then it turns yellow. Uh, is because it's removing all the toxins, all the bad things, out of the bruise. Whereas the angiogram and the CAT scan are both x-rays, the MRI uses radio waves and other magnetic in energy to visualize the structures in the brain. Uh, small changes in structure, as small as the myelin uh, on uh, individual axons, can be visualized. PET scans are, are uh, machines... PET scans are machines that detect radioactive activity in the brain. The, radio, the radioactivity comes from radioactive impregnated glucose injected into the brain. Each cell of your body utilizes glucose. So if we inject you with uh, radioactive glucose and then we take an a, uh, uh, x-ray of your brain, what we will see is the areas of your brain that are more active. In other words, the cells of your brain that are utilizing the most glucose. As the various areas of the brain metabolize the glucose, of course, the activity, the researcher can, uh, can look at select tax tasks. Uh, this is an individual looking at, this is an individual who is a cocaine addict, and they are looking at a nature video, and as you can see, not a whole lot of activity. And this is a, a, um, a video of... Uh, somebody utilize, using cocaine, and of course you can see it creates more activity in uh, that portion of their brain. This is the front, right? This is the front of your brain. So that's the uh, your frontal lobe, the thinking portion of your brain, the intellectual portion of your brain. And as you can see, it is more active because they are thinking about using cocaine. 
A functional MRI differs from the MRI machine in the intensity of the magnetic signal used because a functional MRI is so powerful it can detect minute differences in metabolism. This gives researchers a similar picture as the PET scan, uh, but without the radioactive injection. And this is a functional MRI. And as you can see, we have a tumor right here. Uh, and they have they've taken it out in this second picture. They've removed that portion of the brain. You can see the chunk is missing. There's where the tumor is, and now they, they, the individual can't speak anymore because this is, this is the area of your brain where this is the front of the brain again. Okay. And, okay. Anyway, there you go. That's the end of the chapter. We're going to get into more of this stuff. You know, some of the things that I've mentioned today, uh, we're going to get uh, into later on in the, uh, in the book. So all the fun things I've talked about, uh, strokes and whatnot, I'll give you more uh, information about it uh, later on. Uh, I worked in medicine for 30 years, so some of this stuff is really interesting as far as I'm concerned. That's why I know, have that information. Uh, some of it, some of it, uh, I, some of it's really good information. Uh, and anything you want to know, you can ask me, and I may have information on it, or I may not. You want to talk to if you want to ask me about medication or whatever I can I may be I may have that information I may not <clears throat> most of I, I haven't actually worked in medicine for 20 years uh, I've been teaching uh, but uh, I think it's been 20 years yeah anyway uh, some of my information is dated of course but I, I'll look it up on the online to make sure I know what I'm, what I'm talking about anyway that's the end of the chapter uh, chapter 2. And we will uh, talk again next week. See you later. Stay safe.